good morning. If you would, open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 13. Pastor Roger and his family, uh, they're on vacation today. They're down at the beach, so be praying for him and his family as they get away. Enjoy some time together and some rest. So as you're opening your Bibles up to Matthew 13, let's open in a word of prayer. Uh, God, as we come here this morning, we're thankful for Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we, we lift up your name as we just sang. Lord, it was your blood. It was your work. It was what you accomplished for us so that our sins could be forgiven and we glorify you and praise you here this morning. Lord, as I stand here this morning bringing forth your word, I pray that it is your word that is powerful. God, I am nothing more than an instrument to proclaim your truth. Lord, I pray as your word is, it goes out, Lord, I pray if there's one that hears it and does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, today is the day that they come to Christ. Lord, I pray for our church this morning. I pray for those who are here. Lord, I ask, allow us to hear your word clearly. Allow your word to fall upon open eyes, fall upon open hearts. Lord, it may be here and through it grow and to be more like Christ. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And amen. <clears throat> Last week, Pastor Roger took us through a passage in John that really revealed the true heart of Judas. Judas's betrayal of Jesus was beginning to unfold. You know, each time I read through this story of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus, I am amazed at how a man who spent nearly three years of his life with someone who he saw the miracles that Jesus performed, he saw the things, the people that he healed, the messages that Jesus proclaimed. He saw Peter walk on the water before him as Jesus commanded him to do a number of other miracles that happened. And yet, he was able to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now, I was going through the research trying to figure out, you know, what, what's the value of that? And we know that was the value of a slave, but in our terms today, what would that be worth? 30 pieces of silver, what did Judas sell Jesus for? Equivalent today, I found a lot of different numbers, it could be as low as $90 and as much as 2000 Regardless, it wasn't much. And yet, that's exactly what Satan does to someone whose heart is not right. He can make them see things and do things they normally would not do. Throughout the John's Gospel, John prepares the reader for this reality. That, that Judas is going to betray Jesus. His very disciple, his very friend is going to betray him. So each time John mentions the name of Judas, he includes something in there to remind the reader he is going to betray Jesus. One of the greatest pains a person can receive, I believe, is being betrayed by a loved one. And yet the Bible is full of stories of where we see loved ones betraying one another. Going back to the very beginning, when Cain betrays Abel, he lures him out into the field where he murders his own brother. Joseph's own brother throws, throws him into a pit and then sells him off into slavery. Goes to their very father and says, he's dead. An animal killed him. Fabricating the whole story, betraying their very brother. David's own son, Absalom, betrays his father, trying to murder him and taking his very throne. And the stories go on and on. I'm being reminded of a story during the early 16th century. A man by the name of William Tyndall. If you do not know this story, I recommend you, you get the book. Stephen Lawson has a book on his, his life. It is an incredible story. I haven't got time to, to cover all of his story, but William Tyndale was a brilliant man. God gave him the ability to just learn languages. By the time he graduates from college, he knows eight different languages. And he can speak them so fluently that if you were speaking to him, 
in your tongue, and he knew the language, you would have thought he was raised in that language. And so William Tyndale, as his final years in school, he hears of a Bible study that he goes to. It's these men who are studying the writings of Martin Luther. And he's intrigued by what they're talking about. He's intrigued about Jesus. And he's never heard this idea of salvation alone through grace alone. Faith alone, through grace alone. He's never heard this before. And so he's intrigued by this. And he captures his faith. And he grabs hold of it. He brings his faith back home with him. And he, as he brings his faith back home, he notices that all of Europe is lost. Because they do not have the Bible in their language. So William Tyndale begins to translate the Bible into English. In fact, the English Bible that we have today stands on the foundation of the work of William Tyndale. And as William Tyndale begins to translate the Bible into English, he begins to make enemies with the church. And the church begins to see, search him and find him. They cannot. They look everywhere. And they try to capture him and they, and to no avail. So after about a decade, the church finds a family, a very wealthy family who has given their inheritance to their son, and he loses it all in gambling. Has a great debt to pay, and so the church tells this son, if you find William Tyndall, betray him, bring him to us, we'll pay off all of your debt. And so the man does that very thing. The son goes out, finds William Tyndale, becomes a friend of William Tyndale, and as he lures him down an alley where guards are waiting for him, he betrays him with a motion to the guards that this is the man. William Tyndale is escorted off and eventually becomes martyred. Bloody Mary has him sent, and he's burned alive at the stake for the crime of, of translating the Bible into English. Betrayal is difficult. Betrayal is something we've all experienced, but it's for those who love us, when they betray us, those hurt the most. How is it possible? How is it possible for a loved one to be able to betray another? Well, Jeremiah 17.9 gives us the answer to that question. Jeremiah 17.9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Only God can understand the heart. And only, it is only God who can heal the heart. Judas' heart allows him to do the unthinkable, the unimaginable thing of betraying the Lamb of God. You know, often when I read this story, I'll, I'll put myself, or really any story in the Bible, I'll put myself in the position of the character and ask the question, what would I do? Often it's easy to answer, I would play the role of the hero well. I would slay the giant. I would be the one who would walk beside Jesus. I would never betray Jesus. I would be the one who would walk on water. I would go wherever he would go. I would be the one who would slay the lion. But I think all too often, the reality is, it would be the opposite. I would be the one who would slay my brother. I would be the one who would betray my family. I would be the one who would betray my father. I would be the one who would say, I don't know this Jesus. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The answer to this question, of course, comes from the heart. Judas had a love. And that love was not for Jesus. His heart loved something else. His heart loved money. And Satan used this against him. And in fact, if you go back to John chapter 13, at the beginning, when Jesus is kneeling down with his disciples, as they're preparing for the Passover, it, this is what John records happens to Judas. In John chapter 13, verse 2, it says, During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, 
to betray him. You see, Jesus' heart cultivated a love for money, and Satan used that against him. This morning, I want to pause for a moment from the Gospel of John, and I want to ask this question. In fact, is the title of my message here this morning, Do You Have a Judas Heart? Most of us would quickly respond with absolutely not. But a Judas heart doesn't always begin with betrayal. I believe if you go back in the middle of Jesus' ministry when, when Judas is walking with Jesus, and if you'd ask Judas then, Judas, yeah, I love this man. Yeah, I'm going to follow this man. This is a great man. This is a great teacher. But the problem was he was great as long as he's providing for Judas. Judas loved the money bag. He loved tapping into that money bag. But when over the past week and a half, past month, Judas has been hearing these messages from Jesus that he is going to die. Jesus says, I am going to be crucified. I am going to leave you. Where I am going, you cannot follow me. They're going to kill me. And if the teacher is killed, the money flows stops. And so in Jesus' mind begins to unravel. How can I keep going with this? How can this keep on going if our master, if our teacher is gone? And so Jesus, or as Jesus proclaims that he is going to go to the cross, Jesus' heart is becoming corrupted more and more. And Satan uses that. So as we come to Matthew here, Jesus is going to share a parable. In fact, there's a bunch of parables in Matthew. But Jesus begins to transition his ministry in, in Matthew chapter 13, where he begins to start teaching parables for a purpose. Parables have teaching messages behind them. And in fact, it was a common method of teaching at this period of time. If you were a first century Jew, teachers at that time would use parables all the time to explain things. And so Jesus does this here now to proclaim his message. All right, and, and so as we come to this passage here, Matthew chapter 13, let's read it one more time. It says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he went into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, First parable, a sower went out to sow. He sowed some seeds that fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And verse 9 is the key verse to this parable. He who has ears, let him here. That would be my request as well this morning. And clearly, we all have ears. So Jesus is not talking about physical ears right here. He's talking about a spiritual understanding of his word. As Jesus was proclaiming this parable to the people, the people would be in this mindset, well, duh, we're, we're farmers. We understand how this works. If somebody's walking along a path and they drop seeds on the ground and it's on a hard ground, the seeds aren't going to do nothing. And birds aren't going to come and take the seeds away. We all know that. If seeds fall on rocky ground, we know that they'll make their way down into some kind of soil. And we know that they'll grow up really quick. But then when the sun comes out, common sense tells us they'll wither away. And nobody ever plants their crop where there's a briar patch, where there are thorns. You just don't do that because the briars will outgrow them and they will they'll overtake them. We all know you plant seeds in good, fertile soil. So as Jesus is proclaiming this parable in their minds, they hear it, but they don't understand it. And the reality, the next several verses here, from 10 to 17, just explains why they don't understand it. 
And really, that's not the purpose of, of this morning's message. The purpose of this morning's message is to ask this question, do you have a Judas heart? And what Jesus just did, he took us through four types of soil that represents the heart condition. And really, there's only two types of soil. There's good and there's bad. That's it. Now, the bad he divides up into three different categories. But please understand something. No matter which category he is talking about of the bad soil, he is speaking of unbelievers here. The bad soil represents unbelievers. Only one soil represents believers. Those who produce fruitful fruit. And so as Jesus begins to explain this, let's ask a couple questions. Number one, who is the sower? We know here in this passage, Jesus is the sower. He is the one who is spreading the gospel at this time. And Jesus is preparing his disciples that he is going to be leaving. When he leaves, you begin to become the sower. You are now the ones who will go out and you will sow the seed. Which is question number two. What is the seed? The seed is the gospel. The seed is the message that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He didn't come to find people who were good. Jesus came to save those who are bad. Those who understand their need to have their sins forgiven. See, for a person to be saved, you must first understand your need for Jesus. And the parable he uses here is a perfect parable. Because the idea is, if you do anything about planting, a seed grows when you put it in the ground, and after the seed dies, it begins then to become a plant. And the idea right here, what Jesus is talking about, is as this seed is sent out, does it die? Do you die to yourself? That's what the seed does. And only if you die to yourself, and, and I know that's a weird understanding. What do you mean die to myself? What do you mean do I need, do I, do I need to physically die? And that's not what he's talking about here. The idea right here is you're willing to give up your desires and follow Christ. You're willing to humble yourself and give up everything for Christ. And the gospel goes out and says if you're willing to give up everything, you're willing to follow Jesus. He will forgive you of your sins. He will save you. He will redeem you. And Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Only the sower, in this sense, speaking of Jesus Christ, can transform a heart from being dead to alive. You cannot do it. You cannot transform the soil. You cannot transform yourself. Only Jesus Christ can transform that heart. Only He can. And I'd, I'd say, at points in our life, we fall in these categories. There was a time in my life where my heart, my heart was hard towards God. I didn't want God in my life. I didn't want Him. I had no desire for Him. And there was a moment where the gospel transformed my heart, and all of a sudden I saw my sin. I saw my desire, my need for Christ. I gave my life to Him. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this. God gives Ezekiel a promise as to what He is going to do in the future. And in this future, when Christ comes, this is what Christ is going to do. This is the work that only Jesus Christ the sower can do. Ezekiel 26, 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is what the gospel does. This is how the gospel transforms us into a child of God. And so the disciples come to Jesus. Why are you teaching parables? What do you mean by this parable? We know there has to be another meaning to it. There's something else here. 
And so Jesus explains the parable to the disciples. And please, as we go through this, please understand. He's going to explain four types of soil, each representing a condition of the heart. Three of which we're going to call Judas's heart condition. Of these four soils, each and every one of us in this room fall into one of them. There's not a fifth category. There's four. And you land in one of them. And the purpose of this parable is for Jesus to say, examine your heart and see where you fall. One is good. The other three is bad. So listen to what Jesus says here. Verse 18, he speaks of the first soil. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in the heart. This is what was sown along the path. So the first soil he talks about here is this hard soil, the, the soil where the seeds dropped and it doesn't get in the ground. He calls it hard soil. And the idea right here is this is the person who could care less. When I read God's Word, I don't understand it. When I read God's Word, I don't care. When I read God's Word, it doesn't say anything to me that is valuable. I don't care. I like the way I live. I like what I do. I don't want anybody to tell me what I can and cannot do. It is easy for me to close up the Bible and not read it. This is a hard heart. In fact, if we get to ask, what's the attitude of someone who has a hard heart? Let me use some characteristics of a person like this. It's a person not willing to give God the glory for an event. They take credit. It's someone who has a lack, of, lack to care for the sin in their life. It's a person who is, has failure to follow God's commands. It's a person who is arrogant and prideful. It is one who is easily offended, who is resentful and lacks the ability to forgive. It's a person who is indifferent to the Word of God. It's a person who has a failure to believe what God says to be true. I think the challenge is many times... It's a loved one that we see in this condition. We sit here this morning, most of us, hopefully all of us, we've come to know Christ as our Savior. We realize the need for our sins to be forgiven. Our heart's not hard. Our heart has been softened to this truth. And we've turned from our sins and we've turned to Christ. But we have loved ones. Ones who we dearly love and we see the hard heart that they may have towards God. They reject it. And often flat out say they don't care. Even at times looks at us and says, you're the hypocrite. You're the one who claims to be a Christian, but yet I know the things that you do and the things that you say. Remind ourselves of 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They can't see who God is. Their eyes have been blinded. You know, what do we do? We've all got people. If I were to go around and ask you, if you've got somebody in your life who has a hard heart towards the gospel, your answer most likely would be yes. And if somebody that I love, what do I do? Well, as I said back in Ezekiel, it's only God that can transform their heart. So where we go, we go to God and we pray. And we cry out to God to change their heart. To transform their heart to see who He really is. To open their eyes to the need of Christ. Paul struggled with this greatly. His brothers and sisters, the Jewish people, rejected Jesus as he would go and proclaim the gospel to them time and time again, and they would reject him, beat him, one time dragging him out, thinking he was dead and leaving him outside the city. Many times he escaped barely with his life. 
And what did Paul do? He prayed for them. Even to the point Paul said, God, if it was possible, it's not, but the idea behind Paul was this, if it was possible, I would trade places with them. I would go to hell so that they could go to heaven. That was the love that Paul had for the people that he would pray for them. Do you pray for your loved ones with that mindset? Would you be willing to trade places with them knowing their heart of unbelief so that they would be rewarded with Christ? This is Paul's heart. Paul loved them. And Paul prayed for them. And there was times that Paul did see his brothers and sisters come to Christ. And he rejoiced when he did. See, the amazing thing is we know this. God's in the business of saving people. We don't know who he's going to save. We don't know when he's going to save. We don't know where he's going to save. But we know he does save. And we persevere in praying for our loved ones. To pray that God will save them. So he comes to... The next soil, and here's the thing, the next two soils, in my opinion, these are the two most dangerous of, the, of them all. I believe they represent what we call today church people. People who have grown up in church, people who have come to Christ, people who have heard the truth, people who on the outside, you look at them, you say, yes, that's a believer, yes, that's a Christian. But see, Jesus is going to the core, the heart of a person. We can hide our heart from people, but you cannot hide your heart from God. And so what does Jesus, what does Jesus say here? The second soil, verse 20. He says, and for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. The rocky heart is one who hears the gospel and they like what they hear. You mean I don't have to go to hell? You mean if I pray this prayer I get to go to heaven? You mean Jesus can fix my life? You mean Jesus can fix my marriage? You mean Jesus can reward me with these things? You mean Jesus can be my genie? He can be my vending machine God that I can call out to Him and take things whenever I want it? Sign me up for that. What do I need to do to get into that? I want that. And often that is the message that's being preached so many times in the pulpit today. Listen to me. Jesus Christ did not come to this earth to make your life better. Yesterday, Justin and Heather and I were sitting, we were having breakfast, and we were talking about you know, going through the book of Ezekiel, and one of the things we were talking about was that very thing right there. If your best life is now here on this earth, well, you've got some, you've got damnation coming to you. I don't want my best life to be now here on this earth. I want my best life to be when I see Jesus Christ. See, here on this earth, there's nothing in comparison to what Jesus has to offer. And if this is my best life now, I'm in trouble. What Jesus has to offer for all eternity is so much grander and great than what this world can ever offer us here. In fact, do you know what Jesus says? If you come to me, you will, you will get, not most likely, you will get persecution, trials, tribulation, because this world hates Jesus. And if, he hate, if this world hates Jesus, guess who else this world hates? Me. And you. And when you, in a sense, Come on board, join the team. The world has put a target on you. And persecution comes. And so Jesus says, when the sun comes up, this is the persecution on the, on the one who claims to be a believer. And it's too great. And you reject him. And you walk away. The attitude of a heart on rocky ground is this. I can't live like this anymore more is a person who says 
Religion is too hard. There's too many things I have to do. There's too many things I can't do. There's laws here. There's things here that I have to do, and I can't do it. Understand something. If your salvation is in you and you alone, you're right. You can't do it. You cannot save yourself. And often that's what this points to right here. This heart condition is one who is trying to save themselves. If it means I get to go to heaven by coming to church, I'll be there. If it means I get to go to heaven, if I read my Bible, I'll be there. If it means God will bless me and give me the desires of my heart, I will pray and I will ask for them. What happens when it doesn't become true? What happens when a loved one that you've been praying for and praying for and praying for dies of cancer? What happens when the preacher stood up and said, God will heal your loved ones, God will heal your marriage, and it doesn't come true? Who's the liar then? And often, this person will say, God, you lied to me. You ask many atheists today why they're atheists. And the response is because of this right here, because God didn't keep His promise. God did not fulfill what He promised me He would do. Listen, the promise that God gives you is this. I will save you and I will keep you saved for all eternity. If you don't believe me, look at the cross and look at what I did for you. I hung on that cross and the blood that I shed, the wrath that I endured upon God was for you so you wouldn't have to experience it. Come to me for that reason. Don't come to me because of what you can get. Come to me because I love you. That is the message of the gospel. The problem with that is this. You have to admit first you're a sinner. You have to humble your heart and come to God. That's the challenge that we have. And this type of soil right here misses that. The third soil is the thorny soil. Verse 22, As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitful the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves to be unfruitful. I believe if there's a category that that Judas fell, fell into, it was this one right here. And the idea right here is you didn't walk by and you threw your seeds in a, a briar patch. The idea is where you sowed your seeds, there was thorns. There were seeds of thorns that would grow up with it. And they would grow up together. It's the idea of the wheat and the tares that he's going to go to here, here shortly after this passage. It's the idea that as they grow together, what happens? Here's the thorny heart. They hear the gospel and begin to see themselves as Christians. I can live like that. I can do that. I, I can work my way to heaven. Yeah, I don't mind coming to church. It's a pretty good place. It's Pretty good people at church. Yeah, I don't mind reading the Bible. There's some good stuff here in the Bible. So they begin to see themselves as Christians. The Bible or the, the world would define them as good people. It's someone who says, I can look like one and I can act like one. I can do the walk, I can do the talk, but when they look at the world, there's an attraction that the world can give that Jesus can't. And they're drawn to it. And their eye is constantly, one's on Jesus and one's on the world. I want both. I, I want both. Why can I not have both? And Jesus made it very clear, did he not? You cannot serve both God and man, or God and money. You cannot have two gods. God says either me 
or it's nothing. You can't hold on to me with one hand and your foot in the world. You can't do it. And this is the person that says, I can. I can live that way. I can have the things of the world, and I can also look and act like a Christian. I want the sin the world has to offer. Ultimately, is what the heart of this person. I want money. I want power. I want sex. I want fame. I want it, and I'm willing to give up anything to get it, is where the heart ends up taking you, and this is where Judas was at. Money was his God. The root, the love of money, is the root of all evil. And Judas is an example of that. He was willing to betray the very one he loved because of his love for money. And it was nothing. It was nothing in comparison to what God could give and grant to him. See, that's what Satan does. Satan hangs a dollar bill in front of you and says, if you take this dollar bill now, it'll give you anything you want. It's, it's a dollar bill. Take it. You know you want it. And God is saying, listen, I have an un." countable amount of wealth to give to you. That's what heaven has to offer. But I want the one dollar. I want what Satan has to offer. And that's the attraction that Satan places before us with this world. The world promises you, the world promises so much. But what it gives is pain, sorrow, loss, doubt, guilt, and you can go on and on. The world will destroy you. And so, we come to, before we come to this last soil, here's here's my concern. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this in verse 21 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Of all scripture, this is ranks at the top for me when it comes to scary verses. These are people who claim to be Christians. These are church people who says, God, did we not pray in your name? God, did we not go to the hospitals and pray over people for you to heal them? God, did we not visit the sick? God, did we not go on mission trips? God, did we not do these things for you? And the sad reality is, These people that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 7 are people with stony hearts and people with thorny hearts. Ultimately, it was not about Christ. Judas was not about Christ. Judas was all about himself. And really, as we go through these first three soils, I ask you to examine your heart and say, do I fall in one of these categories? As I look at my life, and, and granted, here's the thing. Are there times our hearts hard towards God? I think so. Are there times that we look out into the world and say, man, they've got it all. Why don't I? Are there times that we look and, and we fall into this trap and we say the Christian life is hard? I think in our life there's times that can happen, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about a heart condition that characterizes who you are. When you examine yourself, this is who you are. This is the core of the person that you are. And so he takes us to the last soil. And here's here's my plea to you. If this last soil does not represent you, Humble your heart. It is God who can take a hard heart and transform it into good soil. It is God who can take a thorny heart or a stony heart and transform it into good soil. That is where we want to be. Because listen to what he says now. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit 
and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, in our case, 60, and in our 30. Yes, and the good heart. This is the one who hears the gospel. They understand their need for Christ. They understand that their sins must be forgiven. And they turn to Christ. They give up the desires of their heart. It's not that God says, you know, I want you to give up everything that you do and you, nothing matters in your life. In a sense, that is true. But at the same time, we live in this world, but we're not of this world. God will provide for us everything that we need as we are here. But the desires of our heart need to be desires in line with who God is. And so the, the good heart, the good soil is one who turns to Christ for forgiveness of their sins and turns to Jesus. In that act, God transforms that person. They become a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away. Behold, all new things now have come. I am a new person in Christ. My desires have changed. My heart has changed. My mind has changed. I have changed the way I live my life, the things that I do. Now, do I still sin? Yes. Do I hate it? Absolutely. It's a characteristic that comes with being a Christian. You hate your sin. But your life changes. You begin to produce fruit. And know something, you always produce fruit. Not everybody produces good fruit. But those who are in the good soil, you produce good fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Not every Christian is the same. And I have to remind myself, not everybody's like me. And you're probably saying, thank God everybody's not like me. <laughs> See? The thing is... We're all different. God saves us all when we come to know Him as our Lord and Savior. But He uses us differently as well. Some have produced more fruit than others. Does it mean there ain't less of a Christian? No. No, it doesn't. So my question to you this morning is this. As we examine our heart and ask, do I have a Judas heart? Has there been a time where you've humbled yourself before Almighty God? Where you've realized your need for a Savior? Where you realize your need for Jesus Christ? Where you realize that I can no longer do this on my own? I can't do it. I need Jesus. I need Him to transform me. I need to be like Christ. See, the goal of the Christian is that as we go through life on this earth, we become more and more like Christ. The more you become like Christ, the more fruit you will produce on this earth. So when Jesus talks about fruit, what's he talking about here? Well, ultimately, he's talking about sharing the gospel. All things talking about sharing more seed, sowing more seed in this world. The closer you are to Christ, the more of His Word you will sow. The more of Him you will be like. So as we sit here this morning, there are people in our life that I'm sure you know that have a Judas heart. Maybe that's you this morning. Let me just remind you, we serve a God that is powerful. A God that can transform any heart. God took the heart of Paul, who was zealous for God, who hated Christians and transformed him in a way to where you would not have recognized him. His love for God changed. And so will yours. You don't know him. Please come to know Christ today. I'll be here. I'll be more than happy to talk with you after service. We have elders that would love to talk to you after service. If you don't know Christ, if you're not sure what soil you fall in, stay and talk. Let's take God's word and continue this study even further. God, as we come here this morning, we are thankful for what you've given and what you've done for us. We're thankful for Jesus Christ. 
We're thankful for the work that He has accomplished. We're thankful for the love that He showed us on the cross. God, we just uh, lift up our voices to You here this morning. Lord, I pray that as Your Word was heard this morning, if there's one, whether it may be online or here with us this morning that does not know You, God, today is a day that You open their heart, open their eyes to this truth of who You are. God, we love You. We thank You for just what You've given and what You've done for us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And amen.